In 1936, the Spanish military launched a right-wing coup against the democratically elected Republican government. The working class responded by taking up arms, taking over farms and factories, and launching a far-reaching social revolution. The resulting civil war would set peasants and workers from all over the world against the military might of nationalist Spain, fascist Italy, and Nazi Germany. This is Working Class History. Before we get started, we just wanted to give a quick reminder that this podcast is funded entirely by our listeners on Patreon. You can support us and get access to exclusive content, like early listening to both parts of this double episode, as well as other bonus episodes at patreon.com slash workingclasshistory, link in the show notes. The Spanish Civil War and Revolution was without doubt one of the most momentous events in world history, although it's not really spoken about in proportion to its importance. For example, the fact that there was a fascist dictatorship in the heart of Central Europe until over three decades after the end of World War II is something which is rarely mentioned. Given how governments of places like the UK, US and France acted during the conflict, the reasons for this should hopefully become apparent over the course of these episodes. It was an extremely complex set of events. Every major political ideology of the 20th century battled it out literally across the country, from fascism to conservatism to liberalism to socialism, communism and anarchism. We can't hope to tell its story in a single podcast or even a double episode. So this is the beginning of an intermittent series of episodes about the Spanish Civil War. In this initial two-part episode, we're going to give a brief overview of the conflict, its background and its aftermath. In future episodes, we'll go more into detail about specific aspects. Today we are very happy to be speaking with Catherine Howley and Nick Lloyd, who live in Barcelona and give excellent Spanish Civil War tours of the city. Nick is also author of Forgotten Places, Barcelona in the Spanish Civil War. More info about the book and tours in the show notes. So to begin, we asked Catherine to explain the underlying tensions in Spanish society which existed beforehand, and which eventually exploded in 1936. Spain pre-Civil War was an incredibly divided society, politically, socially, culturally. Um, And when you reflect on essentially the major reasons for the war breaking out, you could divide them, although it's a lot more complex than just three, but the three major ones are divisions with wealth, divisions in politics and divisions in the Spanish military. So reflecting on the divisions in wealth in this country, We're talking about a period, of course, post the Great Depression, where wealth in Spain was so incredibly divided that when you consider a country that throughout the 19th century had so much political upheaval and division, you still had a nation where 70% of the land ownership was in 2% of the, the population's hands. Southern parts of Spain, for example, Andalusia, you had an image or a snapshot of a, an area of the country where it was still very agrarian, it was agricultural part of the country, but the landowners down there who owned masses of land were treating the peasants as if they were serfs. So there's very much visibly this this situation or this setup in the south of Spain where it's still like a semi-feudal past or kind of this relationship of landowner and the peasant as if, as if it was a serf. When you reflect on what would have been comparably to Britain or France, the industrialization of this country, it had been very staggered because of political divisions and upheaval throughout the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, there were pockets of the country, particularly Barcelona in Catalonia, where industry had slowly become the characteristic of, of that city, that major city on the Mediterranean coast. But Barcelona itself, although it's different snapshot or different language, let's say, being used to the south of Spain with landowner and peasant, you had these industrial class that was becoming increasingly controlling of property and of, of, of the industry, especially textile in Catalonia, and a working class where there's foreign journalists here at the start of the war who can't believe that you're seeing grown adults walking to work in working class neighbourhoods to factories, and they can't even afford to put shoes on their feet. That was, that was the level of poverty. So in comparison, it's just a very different snapshot in Barcelona with this industrialised city that was modern for some people, prosperous for some people, but it was a city where class divisions were very much inscribed in the geography. 
changes in politics have resulted in, in almost the peasants and workers been left in their own orbit of, of being neglected, let's say, by the powers that be. And this, as you can imagine, was creating a huge amount of social unrest, anger, a sense of betrayal amongst the workers and peasants. The second division would be Spanish politics. So when George Orwell arrived, the political situation in Spain, he remarked it was an epidemic of initials. There were so many different political factions involved. He had a hard time kind of creating an idea of who was who and who supported what. But these divisions in a country that the three major pillars of power had been the monarchy, the Catholic Church's institution and the military, huge changes had been on the horizon in Spain by the end of the 19th century, turn of the 20th century. First with the first attempted declaration of a Spanish Republic in the 1870s, which had a very short life. But by the turn of the 20th century, politics were becoming incredibly um, antagonistic. We're already talking about a Spain where the politics on the left, for example, especially amongst the workers and the peasants, there was a huge following of an anarcho-syndicalist movement under the title of CNT. The CNT is the National Confederation of Labour, a confederation of anarcho-syndicalist trade unions, which at the time was one of two major union federations in Spain, the other being the socialist UGT. To explain briefly, anarcho-syndicalism is the practice of creating an anarchist society, that is to say, a classless, stateless, free communist or socialist society, through the practice of syndicalism, organising in workplaces and forming rank-and-file member-run unions, which can fight for improvements here and now, and eventually seize control of workplaces and run them collectively for the benefit of all, instead of private profit in the future. The CNT was just one of many groups vying for influence. All the acronyms and factions can get a bit confusing, so we've put together a brief glossary on the webpage for this episode. Link in the show notes. You had socialists in the country, you had liberal democrats, you had communist party, was small, but, but existed. And on the right, you had the following of an ultra-Catholic party, pro-monarchists, small but increasing in, in, in its influence, fascist party called the Falange in Spain, and you've got this kind of pop puree on both sides, two very incredibly antagonistic political sides, that when the declaration of the Second Republic happened in 1931, it was happening in an environment already that what was kind of promised by the Second Republic and the social reform, and, and although we wouldn't call it radical today, but what they proposed to change in the country, to take it really out from that semi-feudal past and to bring this country into modernity, to finally bring it into the 20th century, as they failed to deliver on what they promised. And within the left wing, that that very splintered or shattered kind of left grouping together, it, it resulted in quite a, a weak coalition, which resulted in, in 1933, another general election being called. And after the left wing's victory, the coalition of the Liberal Democrats and Socialists in 19, 1931, when 1933, a general election was forced to be called again, it was a victory for the right wing. So you feel this kind of, within the space of 1931 and 1936, there's three general elections, and it's a society that's obviously very divided. Politics are very divided, but especially on the left. The third and final division in Spanish society, pre-Civil War, was the Spanish military itself. Spain, having lost its last colonies of Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Philippines in 1898, this blow, what, what they titled it, what they referred to it as, was the disaster. For a country that, particularly on the right, you have this image or this kind of desire of protecting systems of times gone by, which which is proving to, to worsen social inequality across the country, um, losing the colonies meant more than just losing this kind of consistent pillaging of resources. And with the loss of the colonies, you've got also this con concept of the period, imperial golden age Spain that's lost with the loss of the colonies and this, this disaster, disaster for who it mattered to. So when you think of Francisco Franco and his entry into the military academy at the age of 15, he was now part of a new generation of the military that it was very much drummed into their head that they were going to be in a certain way the saviors of Spain. And this essential idea that Spain losing its, its footing on this imperial ladder, or this colonial ladder, when it was proposed to bring Spain back onto that colonial ladder, you could say again, and invade the north of Morocco in what they thought was going to be a very quick colonial expedition. When Franco finally became part of that formation of these Africanistas in, in the north of Morocco, they believed they weren't just a colonial army, but, but they were the saviors of Spain itself. And given this quite horrible title, they were called Africanistas. It was almost that title gave them a special brand of arrogance 
that not just engaged in this brutal colonial battle in the north of Morocco, this part of the Spanish military were constantly looking into Spain from the post in Morocco as if it was their duty and right to stop any political or social reforms or changes in Spain that would take Spain in a direction that they, that they wouldn't tolerate. So it becomes quite evident that you have this kind of fault line in the military of a generation that come and their descendants, really, their, their family members of military. They, they've come from, in many cases, elite families. Um, and it's been this pocket of power in Spain that's only really been threatened now with the declaration of the Second Republic and with the reformist agenda of the left wing government in 1936, which proposed to close down a lot of military academies, to reform the military itself and to reform that to become an army that was bred in a way and that was identified with the idea of the concept of what the Second Republic and what that government in 36 wanted to, to wanted to affect in changes in the country. By Western European standards at the time, Spain was an underdeveloped country, still with a very large peasant-based economy, but it was industrializing. And 70% of its industry was concentrated in the northeastern region of Catalonia and its capital, Barcelona. By the mid-19th century, Barcelona was a city that for many, the population was a veritable hell on earth to live in. The working class population was confined within very few neighbourhoods in the city, whereas the middle class and the bourgeoisie, mainly the new elite because of the Industrial Revolution, had started to steadily migrate to a, a newer part of the city called the Jample, the extension of the city, where workers in the city, there was huge illiteracy rates, the possibility of education or even a de decent health care was, was slim to none. And when anarchism arrived to the city, it came in 1869, word of mouth. So when Giuseppe Finelli arrived to Barcelona, amongst the working class population, that, that, that point in history in 1869, um, socialism had, was very slow to take off in Spain, essentially because of it coming in through theory and, and manifestos. That kind of immediate connection with the, with workers was was a lot more difficult because of the high levels of illiteracy. You also have as well a huge resistance from the monarch at the time to any what was seen to be French political influence coming into the country. And it wasn't until the turn of the 20th century and the formation of the anarcho syndicalist union, the CNT, that you find a big change in in more or less the kind of approach to anarchism. And that is the CNT in 1910 when it's formed in Barcelona as the National Confederation of Workers. The idea is to create these short-term objectives towards the long-term objective, which is a stateless, classless society, but much more based on the bonds of solidarity and what one academic, Chris Ellum, calls the, the mutuality of the oppressed, that the bonds of solidarity to the workers will be essentially these, these boycotts, strikes, organisation, in a way, mutual aid and, and respect amongst the, the neighbourhoods or the barrios here, which exponentially grows. And the growth of the CNT it doesn't just confine itself to Barcelona, but spread throughout Catalonia. It has a lot of influence in the south as well amongst the peasants, partially but not to the same extent as the Socialist Union in Madrid or in the north amongst the miners. But coming from the core of where it was it was created, the CNT in Barcelona in 1910, it started off nationwide with an average of about 45,000 members with its creation. By 1919, that was almost 750,000 members nationwide. So exponentially grew at a much faster rate uh, amongst the peasants and workers in the country than the Socialist Union, the UGT, which, which predated the CNT as a union. In many ways, you could say that anarchism becoming a catalyst of organisation or, or at least kind of thought process in the politicisation of the workers and peasants in this country was a lack of faith in the state full stop, that the state, that the powers that be in Spain had had, had failed the workers and peasants across the country. And, and as a result, this concept of, it, of, of creating a stateless class of society made many ways the most sense um, regarding political motivation amongst workers and peasants. With the background of a deeply divided society and a working class and peasantry heavily imbued with revolutionary ideas, in 1936 a chain of events was set in motion which would result in civil war. February 36, there's a general election between two extremely antagonistic coalitions. On the right side, we have a right-wing coalition moving now towards something more modern than was present in Spain before fascism, heavily influenced by events in Italy and Germany. Without a, without a large, actual, explicitly fascist party, the Falange itself was not a very big party in early 36. And on the other side, we have 
and a, a centre-left coalition, so-called Popular Front. And the Popular Front, the anarchists were not involved in this, went from the relatively small Communist Party through to the Socialist Party, which was the largest party, the left in Spain, and across to a, a, a group of different parties of what we could describe as being liberal, liberal Republicans. This general election is, although the anarchists obviously do not stand as candidates, they more or less support the Popular Front. Because one of the first policies of the Popular Front is to release all the prisoners. So even though they're not actually a part of the Popular Front, at a, at a, on a local level they are actually campaigning for Popular Front uh, candidates. And saying things like, vote with your conscience. As you may imagine, this tacit support of a capitalist electoral body was a significant departure from the ideology of anarchism by the CNT and was to become the first of many over the course of the conflict. And the Popular Front's manifesto, we should also say, was explicitly not revolutionary. It, it says it is pro-free market and has, we could say, a remarkable reformist agenda. It was in lots of schools, land reform, military reforms. And the Popular Front win this election. In terms of the vote, it's a narrow victory, but because of the electoral system, they get a landslide in terms of seats. Already, elements of the right had decided that if the left won the election, they would begin to organise a coup. They said they'll accept the republic if they win the election, but if they don't, they won't. The real plan to the coup begin within a few days of the popular front winning the election. Although, as I say, already there have been plans previous to this depend dependent on the results of the election. And this plan coup becomes, which again begins in February 36, plan, becomes an absolutely open secret. Everyone knows it's coming in the radical press of the left, the warning about it, everyone knows it's coming. And we must emphasize that even though and um, the Socialist Party got the largest number of seats in that coalition. They didn't actually join the physical government, and, and the physical government was made up exclusively of a group of different parties of what we call liberal republicans. Despite that, though, this group of generals and their supporters, all the people around them, start to organise this coup. And that increases the sensation of tension over the coming months. And over the coming months, the right-wing fascist party, the Falange, the genuine fascist element of the Spanish right, in the general elections, they got less than 1% in every single province in Spain. So they, no province did they get, have get more than 1% in the elections. But they are booming in numbers because of the failure of the, of the right to win the elections in February. And the, the mass party of the Spanish right, which was called the SEDA, which was a cat. Catholic semi fascistic party, the youth of the Seda are abandoning it and flocking to the Falange. And the Falange are using their, their, their new membership and their new presence to attack the, um, the Spanish Republican government through street violence and to antagonize, to antagonize the government and to provide, to try to create a violent response from which they can respond to in kind or they can provoke the military to respond them. And this really increases the sensation of tension over the coming months. And there's also some violence to a lesser, much lesser extent but from elements on the left as well, some anarchist groups, but above all we're talking about the flange. And this increases the sensation of tension over the coming months. The rising, the tension is rising between January, um, sorry, March, April, May, June, and into July 1936. And the, the, the actual spark, physical spark of the coup is the murder of a prominent right-wing politician by a socialist police officer, a famous politician called, called Carlos Sotelo. And this is the trigger, if you, it's the spark which brings the coup forward perhaps a few weeks, but it's going to happen anyway. It's not the cause of the war at all. The important thing about the murder of Carlos Sotelo is not that it leads to the coup, because it doesn't, because that was going to happen anyway. 
but it angers so many on the Spanish right that their politicians are being murdered that this electrifies the Spanish right and prepares them en masse to support the coup. To many people, the idea of a socialist police officer might sound a bit unusual, but the Second Spanish Republic had established a special police force designed to be loyal called the Assault Guards. And after one of them was murdered on the 12th of July 1936 by a phalangist in Madrid, another Assault Guard assassinated a monarchist politician in retaliation. But as Nick said, plans for the coup were already underway. General Francisco Franco, who had previously done the bidding of the Republic in brutally crushing an uprising of mine workers in Asturias in 1934, was flown to Morocco from the Canary Islands by two British intelligence officers on a plane paid for by the richest man in Spain. The coup begins on the 17th of July 1936 down in Spanish colonial Morocco, and it begins physically there because it's supposed to begin on the 18th of July, but the local civilian and loyal military authorities find out the coup is in motion in Morocco and try to stop it. And they're all arrested and shot. And so because the secret is out, they have to bring the coup a forward, a day forward. And the fact that they're shot is it kind of something we could say there is that there'd been a whole series of 20 odd, 25 coups, 19th century and early 20th century. A kind of a tradition in Spanish politics. And all of those coups, as much as possible for a coup, were more or less non violent affairs, except for 1936. That night in Morocco, 250 loyal police, army officers, electoral officials, anarchist trade unionists, socialist activists, etc., were shot. From design and effect, day one, it's murder. And then the coup, let's say, spreads chaotically on the 18th of July to southern Spain, uh, to Seville, and then Word reaches on the 18th of July to say the big two cities, Madrid and Barcelona. It was actually, I'm not sure about Madrid, but in Barcelona it was the hottest day of the year. And there's a feverish atmosphere that night in the working class neighbourhood. Everyone knows what's going to happen. First of all, we've got in Barcelona, I'm going to look specifically, we've got the Catalan police, about a thousand who are almost certainly going to be loyal to the Spanish Republic against any coup attempt. Um, and then we have workers, a few communists, which was not a big party at all in Catalonia at the time, before the war, nationalists, Catalan nationalists, two members, the dissident Marxists, and above all, the anarchists, the CNT, the anarchist trade union. And these workers already have a few pistols hidden away here and there under the floorboards. And as the day goes on, they try to get as many more. The poem Nick just referred to were the Workers' Party of Marxist Unification, POUM. They're often referred to as a Trotskyist group, meaning followers of Russian Bolshevik Leon Trotsky, but this isn't accurate. Essentially, they were a communist party, but they were not part of the Communist International, or Comintern, the grouping of official communist parties linked to Moscow. They raid all the arms shops in the city, they go down to the harbour, raid two boats there, get hold of several hundred weapons like that. Then they go to the Catalan government and they demand arms, they say, to save the city. But of course, the Catalan government, from its perspective at least, is in a rather difficult position. They're afraid of the fascist coup, or fascist inspired coup to be correct. They're afraid of the military coup, let's call it. Which they know it's going to happen, but it's also afraid, from the other side, of the mass of the angry anarchist working class and what they might do with his weapons. As dramatic news starts to come in from the south of Spain, some sympathetic Republican army officers opened up, opened up a small arsenal for the workers. They, they had some weapons like that. And there are two sides, two groups organising to stop the military. One through the, let's say, through the government, Catalan government, through its police, and two by the workers, principally anarchists, strange allies. I don't suppose that many people slept that night in Barcelona. It was very hot. Um, everyone knows what's going to happen. 
and 4.30 in the morning, the military wake up the conscripts in the barracks and give them a double ration of rum and tell them they're coming to, to, to crush a supposed anarchist revolt. And as soon as they wake their way, way out of the barracks, the trade unions, the CNT and the social trade union, the UTT, set up all the factory sirens in the city. And this is a pre-arranged signal, a call to arms the people to rush the streets to stop the coup. Meanwhile, Satrip separately, the Catalan government goes on bash on a radio, denounces the coup and sends out its police. And the military who think they can take the city while it's still asleep instead of immediate attack. Uh, groups of workers, groups of police. The fighting continues for a day and a bit. And really, though, by the Sunday evening, it's almost over. Um, in some places, it's more the police. and Plaza Catalonia, it would be more the police. In Pablo Sec, it would, where I'm sitting now, it would be more the anarchists. And the, the last act is um, in the next morning when the, the port area, which is still in military hands, is stormed by the CNT, the Anarchist Trade Union. And that was the end of the coup in Barcelona. And it failed by a combination of worker and police resistance. And a debate about which side contributed the most. There certainly were more workers killed, um, but probably neither side could have won without the other. And the coup fails in most of the big cities in Spain, Madrid above all, um, but it succeeds in a few key cities, Seville, and Zaragoza, and most importantly, as we've said, it succeeds in Spanish colonial Morocco. And that's crucial because that's the only place where there's an army of any battle experience. Why the battle experience? Well, because of the colonial war which the Spanish state had been waging in Morocco until the mid-20s, a brutal colonial war, which is actually one of the things that brutalizes the Spanish army. In addition to the Spanish Army of Africa, Franco would also call on Moroccan colonial troops to fight against the Republic. The Republican government could, of course, have previously decided to give Morocco its independence. However, like most European liberals, they did not extend their progressive agenda to their colonial subjects. Anyway, when the initial street fighting was over, the Republican government reeling and essentially powerless, Spanish workers and peasants set about radically reorganising society themselves. When the coup fails in Barcelona, rather than heading home that night to bed, the anarchists in the city started to um, spontaneously what they call commandeer motor cars around the city and use these vehicles to raid or to storm the military barracks which existed in Barcelona. So from that season, what's estimated to be 50,000 weapons, you find this shift of placement of power where you have a wave of celebration by the workers, mainly anarchists in the city, for their role in helping defend Barcelona. And secondly, they've now got 50,000 weapons in their arms. Some of these people couldn't afford to put shoes on their feet. They're now armed to the teeth. So there's a very obvious shift in presence or power of the CNT in Barcelona. And the next five days after the coup failed in Barcelona, what has been called or referred to as a revolutionary fiesta begins in the city. The celebration almost like a manic kind of celebration, a revolutionary fiesta begins for five days. But after that five days, the revolutionary fiesta, the local government in Barcelona, the Catalan government, the Generalitat, who at the time had only about 1,000 police at its disposal, were armed and ready. They obviously feel that tip of power or placement into the anarchists' hands. And with such little police really to effect to stop this revolutionary fiesta and in a certain sense bring the city back to normality as the war is breaking out elsewhere, they eventually convince some of the anarchist members to come in for talks and plead with them not to lead the revolution. They've been toying with this idea of seizing the means of production, collectivizing the industry, leading a revolution, of course, being anarchists. But the government's argument that was essentially that the war was the priority and the guns should be used to, to arm militias at the front line. So amongst the CNT, the decision was made five days after this revolutionary fiesta to use the guns for those that wanted to join the anarchist militias and be the volunteers at the nearest front line to Barcelona. The guns would be used for that purpose. And those that wanted to would go back to work the next day in the industry in Barcelona. However, it's almost like this tipping point takes place for part of the population, the working class population that have been toying with the idea of collectivization an organisation on a horizontal level for so many decades. When they go back to work after five days of celebration, back to work with the knowledge, of course, they've got 50,000 weapons behind them 
in many cases, the bosses have left, they've gone into hiding, or in the case that about 70,000 Catalan members of the elite pack up their bags and start this mass exodus. They go to Italy, some go to France, some essentially take this opportunity to go into hiding or go on extended holidays, waiting for the situation in Barcelona with the anarchists armed to the teeth to blow over. So this opportunity in a way, it presents itself that when the anarchist workers, or the workers in Barcelona start to go back to work after five days of this revolutionary fiesta, they see the opportunity and they grasp it to reorganize the factories under workers' control, horizontal line management, and they succeed within two weeks in collectivizing what's estimated to be between 70 and 80 percent of industry and commerce in Barcelona. Now, it's not just in the city of Barcelona itself, the contingency or the support of the CNT, it's strongest essentially in Catalonia, although it existed elsewhere in the country, but it starts to happen on almost like a domino effect in other towns and other small cities across Catalonia. Within two weeks in Barcelona, the gas works, the electricity, the water, the transport, everything's up and working perfectly. But behind the scenes, of course, it's never been so different because this pecking order or this hierarchical order now has been replaced by an incredibly well-organized system of horizontality, where the workers now are rethinking the average day of work, how many hours to be worked, the payment of the workers, the facilities in the factories themselves, setting up childcare facilities, shower facilities, libraries, Again, to stress the point that they've been toying with the idea of revolution for decades at this stage, they've just grasped the opportunity now. And needless to say, the workers were the cogs. They were the, they were the machinery that made the factory work. And the difference is now that the hierarchy is gone and they're recreating this on a horizontal level. To such an extent that unemployment disappears in Barcelona after a month of revolution beginning. The anarchists that would leave Barcelona volunteering to become the militias from the city to set up the nearest front line, which was about 300 kilometers away to take back the city of Zaragoza. The revolution, although they leave the revolution in the industry behind in Barcelona, as they continued through the countryside in Catalonia and the countryside in Aragon, where Zaragoza is the capital of, they continue the revolution through the countryside, helping peasants collectivize land, machinery along the way. And even you could say that the extent of the revolution actually it reaches the front line itself because that nearest front line to Barcelona, because the majority of the volunteers there fighting against or resisting against Franco and his fascist support as revolutionaries, they continue on the front line with this organization, which is kind of the antithesis, you could say, of rank and final military organization with the anarchist militias. It's organized that no saluting is done. Everyone's on equal pay. There was no, no forced discipline amongst the militias. Every decision in the trenches was voted on. The horizontality that you would find applied to the factories in Barcelona or across Catalonia, in the countryside with the peasants and collectivization of land and machinery was also applied to a certain extent at the front line nearest to Barcelona. Elsewhere in the country, over half the land in the Republican zone was collectivised voluntarily by peasants. Agricultural yields in collectivised land went up significantly, and collectives implemented what revolutionary changes they could based on their local conditions. So, for example, in a couple of areas where there were no shortages, they implemented what the CNT called libertarian communism, whereby money was abolished, tools shared, and what goods you needed could be taken freely from local stores. Although given difficult conditions in most of the country, there were varying levels of revolutionary change. So more common was partial communization, whereby money was replaced with ration cards um, or labor vouchers allocated to each family, which could be used to distribute scarce food items with plentiful items available freely. Much of industry outside Catalonia was collectivized as well under workers' control and workplaces were heavily rationalized so lots of small workshops were shut down and instead only larger factories with the most efficient machines were used. And a lot of production was diverted towards the war effort, arms manufacture and the like. Public services like health and transportation were rapidly improved and expanded. In total, it's estimated that up to 7 or 8 million people were involved in the revolutionary process, out of a total population of around 25 million. For women in particular, the revolution drastically transformed everyday life was part of Republican stroke revolutionary ideas that women and men were equal. Um, now, how that played out on the ground was obviously always going to be different, but from a 
the bases was that men and women were equal. And this surely had effect on the far lower level of violence against women on the Republican side against women on Franco's side who suffered atrociously. As occurs frequently, ideological belief or support for equality doesn't always translate into equal treatment in reality, as many of the women who volunteered to fight in the militias on the front lines would unfortunately find out. Perhaps some of the more recognisable or, or iconic photos of the Spanish Civil War are photos of generally young women in overalls with rifles. What is known of the women militias or the volunteers that would fight at the front line against fascism, the estimate is a few hundred women would volunteer to fight at the front line. Many historians have reflected on now and concluded that more than anything, the photos that we see in this, there's hundreds if not thousands of photos of women with rifles and at the front line or preparing to go to the front line can be interpreted as in many ways propaganda. As the war broke out after the the attempted military coup, the Republican government's decision initially to disband the army, perhaps a huge mistake, results in the necessity for militias to be called up across the country to organise themselves and to fight at the front line against Franco and his fascist support. When you're trying to convince, you can imagine a young population to be trained and to risk their lives in the front line fighting. The image of the woman with the gun on their back or, or leaning against a rifle at the front line or on their way to embark to the front line becomes an iconic image as I said, the historians now reflect on, or at least agree, that was used in a way to try and coerce or to guilt men into joining the fight at the front line when they saw a plethora or a huge amount of images of women, because they perhaps challenging their masculinity or, or whatever way you want to digest it. But it's not to take away from the fact that, that many women made the decision consciously to fight at the front line. But the reality that you find in some of the accounts of these women is that when they got to the front line, that the attitude of many male comrades was laughing or, or teasing or, or, or kind of disbelief that women were capable to fight as equals. And the expectancy in many ways is that you were there to cook or to clean or to nurse. There was also, during the war as well, a campaign that was against women at the front line, saying that they were distracting the men and because of sexual encounters, whether well, it was spreading disease or it was tiring the men and they weren't being as effective as fighters. And that was the fault of women at the front line. So I think taking it from very many different angles, there were women who genuinely wanted to go to the front line to be treated as equals and fight alongside male counterparts or male comrades, better said. But the reality was that many of these women would turn around and make the decision to come back uh, in the case of Barcelona to the revolution that was happening here and they became key figures in the organisation of collectives and factories in, throughout the revolutionary period from July 36 until May 1937. It's worth pointing out that sexism at the front wasn't a universal experience. For example, Contra Perez, a member of the CNT who fought in the Hilario Zamora column, said of her comrades, quote, They never treated me differently than anyone else or separated me from the group. There was truly great respect. But many organisations, especially the Communist Party, argued that women's place was not at the front, but in the rear guard. In the end, women fighters were banned from the front, partly in a futile attempt to appear less radical so as not to scare off potential support from the supposedly democratic allies like Britain and France. Although none of the women's organisations, not even the most radical, actually opposed the measure. When it comes to women leaving the front line or disillusioned with the lack of, let's say, um, equal or fair treatment on the front line. Um, in many cases in Barcelona, the call back to the revolution of becoming a figure and a very influential figure in the revolution here was through the group of uh, anarchists called Mujeres Libres. For a lot of the founders of Mujeres Libres, which predates the civil war itself, this group, they felt that the CNT, in many ways, although they, they stood for horizontality and equality, that only went so far. The utopian rhetoric of the anarchists in the recreation of a society that was equalitarian. In many ways, Mujeres Libres, the founding members and, and, and those that would join Mujeres Libres, felt that many of the men and women as well in Spain that would identify as anarchists or narco-syndicalists, when they got home in the evening, that utopian rhetoric in a way was packaged at the doorstep. And in the domestic environment, the patriarchal society in Spain was still incredibly ingrained in people's marrow. So Mujeres Libres, when the revolution began in Barcelona, essentially in the industry, there was almost like many revolutions in one taking place. 
To begin with, the Mujeres Libres one, as they organized separately from the CNT, they called on women to organize what you could say is an incipient sexual revolution, where they started to challenge these stereotypes and gender roles and the patriarchal society. The Mujeres Libres, which translates to free women uh, that Catherine spoke about, were an autonomous women's group linked to the CNT union. We're going to talk more about them and women in the revolution in general in a future episode. As often in wartime, many more women began to become wage workers. As men started to leave, to fight on the front line and to volunteer as militias, roles that wouldn't have been usually assigned to women of responsibilities in factories because of that gender discrimination that Mujeres Libres were arguing needed to be rectified or challenged in Spain is that because of necessity, women are actually getting passed on roles in factories of organisation. They're now, for example, becoming team leaders and members of what was industry that once before would have been textile, but now it was being used, this textile industry, in the production of uniforms or material that was needed for the militias and to equip the militias at the front line. So there's a change in the industry as the war is going on, as the demands of the war create different demands in Barcelona for products and productivity. A lot of these women figures that wouldn't have been given the chance we can assume beforehand end up becoming these key figures in the collectivization of, of factories and the running of the factories during the war. Not much has been written about the history of LGBTQ people in the Spanish Revolution, but briefly, homophobia was widespread in Spanish society at the time, to an extreme extent on the nationalist side, uh, but also to a lesser extent on the republican side. There were a number of prominent lesbians in Spain, like Lucia Sanchez Saunil, a former telephonist, anarchist and avant-garde poet, who was one of the co-founders of Mujeres Libres. Probably the most famous gay person of the era was the socialist poet and playwright Federico Garcia Lorca. Documents uncovered recently suggest that nationalists in Granada, aware of him being gay and a socialist, abducted him, executed him and buried him in a shallow grave. To date, his remains haven't been found. That's it for part one of this double episode. In part two, we're going to talk about the international dimensions of the events, about the military conflict, the scale of atrocities committed, and about the aftermath. Relevant levels of our Patreon supporters can listen to that now. For everyone else, it'll be out in two weeks. We'd like to make this podcast more frequent. However, putting together episodes takes us a lot of time and effort. So if you would like more regular episodes, please consider supporting us on Patreon and getting access to exclusive content and benefits. Learn more and sign up at patreon.com slash workingclasshistory, link in the show notes. Short of that, if you appreciate what we do, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and tell your friends about us. You can get Nick's excellent book, Forgotten Places, Barcelona in the Spanish Civil War, link in the show notes. And if you ever find yourself in Barcelona, do make sure to book yourself onto a tour with Nick or Catherine. I did with my partner and a couple of relatives last year and everyone loved it link to that in the show notes as well. We've got lots more information on the Spanish Civil War and Revolution on our webpage about this episode. Uh, Link to that in the show notes, or you can find it at workingclasshistory.com. On there we've got photos, further reading, and sources for everything that we say here. If you want to learn more about the Spanish Civil War, Revolution, or the history of the CNT, we've also got numerous books available about them in our online store. We also have reproduction posters from the conflict and other commemorative merch. Check that all out, link in the show notes. Huge thanks as always to all of our existing Patreon supporters. We literally could not do this without you. Thanks also to Louise Barry for editing these episodes. Our theme tune today was Alas Barricadas, To the Barricades, provided courtesy of the CNT, who re-recorded the song recently for their union centenary. Finally, thanks to you for listening, and catch you next time.